Hello, my name is uh, Lionel uh, Florit. I'm uh, part of the uh, IoT DM project that we have uh, started. John Burns is here, sitting here. Can you raise your hand? John uh, has produced most of the code that was uh, part of this project. Uh, and Jan Medved is uh, in another room uh, presenting some content. This project is about IoT. And what we have done is we have uh, created an application on top of ODL. It's not really related to SDN. We have used ODL as a development platform to, to build something that is completely, is not, is not related to, to SDN. It is, it is an IoT project. There are some hooked with SDN, and we'll see this at the end. So on the agenda, we have, we'll give you an overview of what this project was about. Then we'll talk about uh, IoT middleware, and we'll give you an overview of the IoT middleware technology that we have followed here. In this case, it's, uh, we have followed the specification called 1M2M. And then we'll review the software components, and then we'll see potential links between IoT and SDN. IoT DM at the Linux Foundation, we started the project in December 2014. The goal was to produce a, an IoT middleware over open daylight. Uh, as I mentioned, based on, on 1M2M, and basically we wanted to have the bare bone resources support for that. So minimal implementation, but this would get us started. The delivery was in lithium release, and you have a pointer to the project uh, page here. So the overall architecture is, is uh, shown on this slide. We have reused infrastructure of ODL to build our application. We have reused the uh, data store. We have reused some uh, plugin components. And, and various pieces, the, the MD cell, the ERPCs. And on, on top of that, we have our uh, data collection function. Uh, this is the IoT DM function. This coexists with other ODL services. At the bottom of the, uh, of the slide, you see um, various plugins. In the case of ODL, those plugins connect to network elements. For us, the elements at the bottom could be network elements, but they are mostly things um, in the context of IoT. A network element could be a thing, uh, but you could have pacemakers or uh, traffic lights. Those are things. Our plugin look very similar to the ones we have in ODL. We have, as a matter of fact, we have leveraged the SNMP plugin in some cases. Uh, we have the HTTP plugin, and uh, we have added the co-op plugin here to, to uh, communicate with the things. The uh, northbound part is the connection with uh, vertical IoT applications. Um, northbound, southbound is really a logical uh, uh, separation. I mean, it's just to explain where, how things flow. But in fact, the way applications access the data store or the way things access the data store are identical for the moment. So which IoT problem did we want to address with this, uh, with this application? There are many challenges in IoT. Just, just one of them here is the, uh, the, the variety of things. IoT, an IoT solution is composed of many different components which are unrelated with each other. Uh, when somebody, for example, makes a, uh, a, a Xerox uh, printer, it doesn't expect the Xerox printer to talk to a light bulb, for example. Um, in fact, I would wish that uh, the, light, the, the Xerox printer in my office talk to light bulb so when I step into the uh, copy machine in the copy room, uh, the printer warms up. Because if there is one thing that I hate is to stand by the printer and wait for it to warm up. So if the light bulb um, uh, motion sensor could know that somebody is in the copy room and tell it to the, uh, uh, the, the copy machine, that would, that would be an application. But when you build a, a, a light bulb, you cannot imagine that your light bulb will eventually talk to a copy machine. 
So the, all the things are built uh, for a purpose, but they are not built to talk to, any, to everything else yet. So this is challenge number one. The challenge number two is solution lock-in. Um, when you buy an IoT solution these days, you buy a full system that works end-to-end. -end. Uh, what people don't realize is that when you buy this system, you're locked into the system itself. And this is an example of, of that. Uh, in the US, we've had a, um, there is a big debate uh, going on right now over uh, uh, cameras that you put on police officers. And uh, in 2013, the Congress has funded for 50,000 cameras, $400 list price about, about for one camera. And the idea is for the, the officers to, to film everything that is happening during their, their work day. When they do that, at the end of the day, they come back to the office, they remove their, their camera, they put it on the cradle, and the video is uploaded and archived for five years or a certain am amount of years. In Oakland uh, nearby, uh, we have the, the biggest deployment. It's 600 body cameras. Now, what the police department may not have realized is that when they bought the solution from a specific vendor, they bought the cameras, but also they bought the backend system that goes with the camera so they can manage the video. They also bought the, uh, the subscription to manage the accounts and, and so on and so forth. So they, they bought the, the whole package. What would happen if uh, they are not satisfied with those cameras or they want to introduce a new model or somebody uh, pitched them that instead of having a, a brick to your chest, you could have a pin camera behind the badge from another, another vendor. How would they integrate those new cameras into the existing deployment they have? Well, most likely they can't do it. They, they will have to deploy another system in parallel. Same with the back end. If they are not happy with their back end, but they want to keep the cameras, since the back end and the cameras were, are, are sold by the, the same vendor and it's a proprietary deployment, they cannot change the back end because they would have to change all the cameras. Another way to deploy this is to have this middleware. So the IoT middleware would get the video feeds during the night. So the same operation, the police officer at the end of the day, they remove their camera, they put it on the cradle. The video is uploaded not to the video management system, but to a staging area, an IoT middleware area overnight. And then whoever wants to use this content can just go and tap into it. So in this way, you can add another type of cameras, another vendor, and you can also have any number of backend systems that can openly tap into the video stores. So here is the, enters the middleware. So the IoT middleware's, one of its purpose is to have a standardized API towards the devices and uh, standardized APIs towards the applications, and you interact with the data repository with uh, CRUD and so create, retrieve, update, delete, and notify verbs. On top of that, you can lay out a reasoning layer which will uh, massage the data if needed to be. So this is the that's the context in which we, are, uh, we have produced the, this uh, IoT DM uh, data collector. Now, we decided to follow 1M2M specification. And the reason we did that is because 1M2M was the body that was the most advanced at the time we decided to implement this. We are not sure, we are not advocating that this standard in particular will dominate the IoT uh, space. But we just, uh, we just saw the, we just took the most mature one. A little bit of background of about 1M2M. So the purpose of 1M2M is to have a, um, a common embedded IoT middleware across various verticals. So it's that, when, when we say vertical in IoT, we mean transportation, energy, 
um, uh, education, uh, I mean, various uh, home, um, those are uh, specific verticals that uh, usually IoT uh, systems are optimized for. 1M2M wants to cut across and have a common layer for all of these. So it, en it enables the interoperability, as, as I mentioned, across multiple devices. And it was created by a, a group of SDOs which realized uh, about three years ago that they were working on the same thing. So instead of developing uh, parallel and the same thing in different places, they realized that uh, merging the efforts was of the benefit for everybody. Uh, notice that those SDOs come from uh, all continents, so this is really a global effort. There are about uh, 200 member companies in, in 1M2M at the moment. So specifically what they are defining is a, a set of services. As I mentioned, uh, those services would provide data exchange, and that's the, that's the piece that we have implemented in the ODL IoTDM um, project. Remote device management, security and access control, and uh, connectivity handling. These common services are, have interfaces to applications. They have interfaces to the network in the, in the sense that they will be able to interact with the network and consume services that the network may offer. And also it has an interface towards other instances. So this could be fully distributed. In fact, when this is deployed, in the 1M2M spirit, you would have 1M2M instances on gateways, and then you can have a hierarchy of gateways and eventually um, have a data center uh, instance. So it's a RESTful architecture. All IoT entities are represented in the tree as resources. Applications, devices, data, access rights, billing, everything goes into a resource tree. The attributes of the resource tree describe how the system should manage the resource tree. Uh, you can imagine that if you start collecting data from things, your resource tree may, may grow at uh, an exponential uh, speed. And you want to be able to have the knobs so you, you keep in, in, in check the size of your tree and the shape of your tree. For example, you may want to say, I want to collect data but I don't want to collect, uh, to keep them more than one hour or uh, one day or one month. Um, I want to limit the number of instances of measurements I collect for a specific, uh, a specific device. All of these are, uh, all of this information is embedded into the IoT resource tree. The tree representation is standardized. So any entity that wants to access this tree will know how to navigate the tree, but the implementation itself of the tree is not. So we have implemented this inside the uh, ODL infrastructure using the, the in-memory data store, but you, somebody else could implement it the same tree with the same facade, if you will, but of course on a completely different technology. So by understanding a common tree, IoT components can interoperate. If everybody, everybody knows how to navigate the tree and where to find information in the tree, they will know where to find the measurements, they will know what, where to find the access rights, they will know how to limit access to certain portion of the, of the subtree, and this is all published by 1M2M. This is an example of, uh, of the resource tree as per 1M2M specification, the, uh, the square rectangles are the resources and the, bubble, uh, the, the bubbles uh, are the attributes. So you have, for each resource, you have a set of attributes that tells the system what to do with the resource and how to manage it. For example, who created it, uh, max, the, the maximum number of uh, of instances you have on, on, on the tree, the, the, the location of the, of the resource, so who, where it was created, where the, the record is coming from, et cetera. So this is all metadata that is well-defined and, and published. Some resources are uh, very interesting. So when, when um, 
somebody wants to observe the tree, for example, an application wants to know if things change in the tree, they can create a subscription uh, under a specific resource. And if this resource changes, then the external application can get a notification. For example, you could say, notify me if the temperature of this, uh, of this room exceeds a certain, a certain level, then you'll get, you can get a notification. Or if you have a new measurement of something, then you can get a notification. If something changes in the position of an object, then you can get a notification. Another interesting attribute is this ontology reference. Ontology reference is the it's a pointer to the explanation of what the data means. Because once the data is deposited into the resource tree, for other entities to consume it, they need to understand what it means. They need to understand that number five is kilos or uh, uh, meter per second or so something else. So in the standard, they have thought about this layer of reasoning on top of that, and this is one of the hooks, the ontology reference. I don't know if this, yeah, this is coming. This is just an example of one application we have, uh, we have implemented. It's just one, of the res one resource tree representing this application. It's called location application entity. And what we have done is basically we have, uh, uh, we have created an app that can find objects based on different technologies. So if my, if my phone supports GPS, uh, my phone can also be located with Wi-Fi. If I, if I walk in this room and, and in, uh, there is indoor Wi-Fi, wi -Fi, there could be another way to locate my position. Or um, uh, I can have Bluetooth and eye beacons in the room and I can even more precisely locate my position. So there are several ways to locate things. And in the application we, have, we had created, we had this resource tree where we have the MAC address I can actually can use my pointer. So you have the, the, the MAC address here of the things that we are, uh, we are locating. And under each thing, we have put the technology uh, that we have used to locate those things. So the resource tree looks like this. And you have in the resource tree, if an application wants to know where the MAC address of the phone one is located, the only thing that this application needs to know is how to, get to, to, how to get to MAC address of phone one. And then the, the tree below it is just uh, uh, the, it's each technology for locating this, this phone is represented there. So you have several positioning uh, data uh, below. So it's very easy for an, an, uh, an application that has nothing to do with iPhones, that has nothing to do with the objects you're locating to find the location of those objects. So how would it work in terms of a call flow? You turn on, the you turn on an object, uh, a, a device, what happens? So this is a simplified call flow. You can have uh, other options, but uh, this, I think, uh, gets the point across. When you turn on a device, the device will just uh, uh, authenticate itself and will uh, communicate its credentials that may have uh, been burnt into the device at, uh, in, the in the factory floor when the device was manufactured, or maybe somebody has put credentials inside the device in one way or another. So those credentials are, are communicated to the authentication server. The authentication server will validate those credentials and send back a token to the device. Also, along with uh, the IoT DM, this is the uh, uh, IoT data collector IP address, and maybe some other configuration for the device. And so the device now is well equipped to upload its data to the uh, IoT data collector. So the, what the device does in the data transfer section uh, over here, it will uh, just send a CRUD, create a resource, uh, send along its token, the IoT DM receives that, um, will uh, validate the, uh, the, the token. And if the token is valid, then it can execute the creation of, of a resource. In the context of our project, we have not implemented the token and the security piece. We, just, we have just implementing, implemented the, uh, the writing. So for now, in Lithium, as it stands, 
any device, when it, you turn on the device, the device can just go into the IoT DM and ODL and, and just write into the resource tree. But this, this would be a typical way that the, the device would access IoT DM. So software components, uh, the various software components involved here, typically you have, so first off, you, you have a client and you have the, the, the middleware um, running on ODL. The exchange between the two, if uh, one follow the 1M2M specification, will be in form of JSON. We, ha we support JSON, 1M2M has also provision for XML. We decided to only support JSON because we feel that it makes more sense, it's more compact. And for uh, real um, scenario deployments, we expect that JSON will be mostly, mostly used. So basically what M2M has specified this, the format of this message at the bottom here. And you have a client. The client could be an IoT application or it could be your toothbrush or your fridge. And uh, you have the server on the right hand side with the data store. The client has an IoT application. The IoT application running in the client is the logic that defines what this device is supposed to do. So if the device is supposed to measure temperature, then this IoT application is the, uh, uh, the interface between the, the physical part of the client, if you will, and, and produces useful data. The uh, IoT application will call some uh, methods uh, from a device plugin. What the device plugin typically will do, it will uh, present to the IoT application uh, functions to call, uh, classes to call in the native language that the IoT app is written, and will turn this into a JSON format. So you don't have to so the, the, the person writing the IoT application doesn't really have to understand or to build by hand the, uh, the JSON payload that is compliant to the 1M2M specification. Although this is possible, the, those two pieces, the device plugin and the IoT application could also be bundled. But we expect that it will be easier to uh, produce IoT applications when the device plugin is already uh, avail freely available. So you don't have to, to, to mess too much with, uh, with JSON. We have, in the context of the IoT DM project, we have produced uh, a, uh, a Python client and uh, also a Java client that uh, we have made available. Then you go to the protocol binding. So your, your JSON format, your JSON payload has to write over something, uh, co-op, HTTP is what we support. We will add the support for MQTT in Beryllium. And then the data flows onto the, uh, the data collector uh, to uh, ODL IoT DM and the reverse operation. So there is the southbound plugin here at the bottom and it communicates with the protocol plugin which basically receives the JSON payload, turns around, calls an RPC and uh, send, send the data to the core functions. The core functions of our ETDM will receive this JSON payload, will check if it's valid, will go over the 1M2M procedures to write into the data store and eventually the resource tree is built this way. So, we use Postman a lot. Uh, we have placed a, an instance of, uh, of IoT DM on the internet. So if you want to do CRUDs to it, uh, you can certainly do so. Uh, here, in this case, um, what you're seeing here is, a, uh, is an example. So we have, uh, we have a, a sandbox at this address, and uh, this is what you're seeing here is a well-formatted message for, uh, to create a, um, uh, a, a container inside the resource tree. Now, there is a protocol binding that takes place, meaning that when, when you want to create something into the resource tree, 1M2M speci will specify the format of the payload in JSON, but also will indicate to you 
uh, which header you have to use uh, in order to, uh, to create your resource tree. Um, so it's, I mean, this is fairly easy to do. Uh, we have uh, a set of, uh, John has put together a set of, of, uh, of calls that you can use in order to uh, just uh, uh, create, uh, create uh, uh, objects. So here, for example, um, uh, we are getting the root of the tree. Those abbreviations here, uh, they look a little bit cryptic, but those are 1M2M fields and they're basically telling you what this resource tree is about. It, it, it's describing what I showed you in the graph with the bubble, uh, the bubble diagram. Um, it's, it's showing uh, the name of the, of the tree. It's showing the, uh, the identity of the tree, uh, the type of resources supported, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so here, uh, so those are, again, it's a library of, uh, of, of CRUDs that you can reuse. Uh, as you send, you send, you can see the, for example, here I just created a, uh, an, an application entity container. And um, so here there is, the, there is the metadata related to this, uh, to this container. So it's very straightforward. And again, easy for you to, to test because the, the instance is running on the internet. So you don't even have to, to install anything on, uh, on your local system. Now, there are some cases where you cannot modify the client. Um, you may interface, for example, with routers or with uh, devices that you don't control. If that's the case, then there is also an option to uh, connect non-1M2M aware clients. If those non-1M2M aware clients talk another protocol, then what you have is the need to develop a, uh, a proprietary plugin. Um, one example of that, it's not really proprietary, but it's not 1M2M, is when we connect to routers, we wanted, for example, to know uh, the, the load of, of, a, uh, of a specific port. Uh, to a router. So we used SNMP, and in this case, well, the, the, the payload and the proprietary communication is actually SNMP to a router. So the, the router is the client, it does the routing business, it talks SNMP to the, uh, um, the, uh, the southbound protocol plugin from ODL, and then the proprietary plugin basically takes the SNMP payload format it in a 1M2M format, turns around and calls and send it north to the, uh, the core functions over in our PC. A very easy, very easy plugin to develop. So when, when could you contribute? If you wanted to contribute, you may want to contribute in the core functions uh, by adding or expanding this 1M2M uh, features. You can also contribute in terms of uh, protocol plugins. You can contribute with the device plugin if, for example, you want to develop a, uh, a, plug, a device plugin for phones. And then uh, um, that would be very useful for the community. Of course, IoT applications is something that uh, can be developed. Now, where is the intersection between um, SDN and IoT? As I mentioned earlier, all our project was using ODL as a development platform for, uh, for IoT. Uh, but there are, once, once you have the IoT data on the, on the controller, there are things that you may want to do um, that could be interesting. So Moore's law says that uh, you will have IoT devices will be more and more intelligent and uh, we will create very complex networks as we go. You may have seen other presentations in the week, and those networks that IoT will produce uh, will grow larger and larger. So manual management is not gonna be an option for these, all of these things, and we'll have to, to, to find a way to steer the traffic or to maintain the traffic of IoT in, and to manage this, this, this this myriad of little bursts of traffic we'll get 
into the data store. So two main topics emerge is the, uh, the data plane management and NFV. So data plane management meaning maybe you want to isolate the, uh, the IoT traffic. Uh, maybe you want to protect the IoT traffic Maybe you want to isolate a certain flow because you want to observe it from a given device. So this is definitely a topic of interest. Uh, NFV, of course, is in the mix because you may want to send the traffic of a certain um, of, a, of a device into a firewall because you have detected that uh, all of a sudden your fridge was uh, Downloading, downloading hundreds of uh, megabytes of, of data from your network. And so that's not what a fridge is supposed to do. So maybe you want to observe that fridge. And maybe you want to take just this flow and send it into a deep packet inspection or, or intrusion, intrusion detection system. So security is also a big deal. So data, data plane management, security, you want, to, you want access control policies and authentications. Maybe you want to nail statically the, um, uh, to pair the devices to a given um, uh, IoT DM instance. So if a device comes online, you want to make sure that this device actually exchange information only with one data store and not, uh, and not anywhere else. So it goes only to this one uh, one IoT DM instance that you have defined for this, this class of device. Traffic engineering capabilities, as I mentioned, it can help se segregate or block some network passes and uh, the uh, policy distribution also. Uh, so GBP may be uh, playing a role here. Those are uh, things that we are, we are actually um, looking at. So in conclusion, uh, ODL has proven to be a, a flexible platform for, uh, for IoT for us. Um, the IoT DM project uh, was released as part of Lithium. Uh, it brings IoT data awareness to an SDN controller. And there is synergy between uh, IoT and SDN and security and resource management are, are definitely uh, two topics worth exploring. If you're interested in more and you want to participate to our project, um, well, first, if you're just interested in seeing how it works, you can go to the developers.cisco.com and you can find the IoT DM sandbox. This is where we put the, uh, the instance of IoT DM so you don't have to install anything. If you're a developer and you, you, have, uh, you have the need to interact with a, a 1M2M compliant system, then you can do it uh, for free here. So again, if you're a developer, that's, that's something you can do. Or you can also install the IoT middleware locally. Um, we have instructions on how to do that. Uh, you, when, as you install ODL on your system, you just enable the uh, ODL-1M2M feature, and off you go. You're, you're all... Uh, autonomous and you can, you can CRUD to your, to your system locally. If you're a Java developer and you want to contribute to the IoT middleware, then uh, you can come to our page and, uh, and find us there. This is it. Do you have uh, questions on this topic? The No questions. Yes. So uh, your question is. Uh, no, I'm not sure if I if I hear there is a lot of background noise here, so so the devices do a lot of things and you want to manage, right. to manage. Right. Right. Yes. 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 
Yes. Yes, I, I understand. So thank you for the question. Um, so the question is, you have a plethora of devices and they export very unrelated um, information. And how do, you, um, how do you reuse that information as you receive it? This, this uh, data repository is generic. So you can receive information from any type of device uh, doing any, any sort of things. What the device needs to do is it needs to be programmed to know where to write its uh, information. And uh, um, once it, it knows where to write information in the resource tree, it will deposit its information there. Uh, any application can come and consume that information that the device has uh, deposited. So this is for the information exchange. Now, devices can also be, should be managed and actuated and operated. This is another part of the 1M2M specification that we have not implemented yet. But um, the way the information is deposited can be easily retrieved by any entity whatsoever. So this is really the point of this project, is to enable, to decouple the application, the IoT application space and the device space. Yes? Yes. Yes, v thank you for the question. So there is a time series uh, data project that is going on which allows um, any type of data to be um, written into um, uh, known um, databases, Cassandra, H2, and other SQL. This is for us one of the biggest benefits of being uh, an application running on, on ODL because we will get this for free. So we will have this API, the API of this project, and we can just push data onto, towards this project and we get the benefit of having those databases behind ODL. So for us, it's fantastic. And, and uh, so I mentioned other southbound plugins that we, we were re reusing from ODL. Uh, earlier, uh, there is XSQL also. This is, was another project uh, which uh, can turn this uh, resource tree into an SQL structure. We can export to SQL, we can export to CSV, and we haven't, we haven't done it. We have, we have just reused what was there from the existing ODL infrastructure. In the, in the case of that uh, time, ba time series uh, data, yes, it will be an external database. Right now, it's just right, right now it's just the uh, resource tree, um, the, the, the uh, in-memory data store that uh, everybody uses. We have reused the same facility. Totally possible. You remember the, the JSON format? So the JSON format has fields for attributes for the various resources, and then there is a field for the actual content of the data. This content could be encrypted itself. So it could be a, a, a series of a string, and that string is, could be the, uh, the, the encryption, the encrypted representation of actual data. And in this case, uh, a reasoner that would be uh, installed on ODL to massage the data would not understand that, that piece. But there is a benefit still, which is the data exchange between um, different parties. Now, those different parties need to have the keys and the algorithm to decrypt that piece of that string, that encrypted string. But at least it, everybody knows where it is. It can be accessed. So in the case of this, uh, the, the video, um, example that I mentioned earlier, uh, the video file could be encrypted and could be deposited there. And if you have the, the right key, then you know where to get it. And that's very easy.
Yeah. So, uh, so the question is, how do you, um, how do you uh, push data to the device, and uh, how do you uh, deal with rogue devices if uh, the device starts to misbehave? Pushing data to the device, you can uh, send notifications to the device. Now, it depends on the underlying protocol. For example, um, HTTP does not really support that. You have to do a post to the device if you want to, to do it. So HTTP is not, it would not be the best. Uh, WebSocket, if you, uh, this, this is in the plans. It's, it, it's being defined in 1M2M. So this is a way to communicate bidirectionally with the devices and to wake up the, the device. Uh, co-op uh, is also another way. So co-op uh, allows the device to um, keep the connection in an observed state. So you can observe resources and then the data store can send notifications to the device this way. So it will depend on the underlying uh, protocol. The SD, I believe SDN can also be a way to uh, deal with the rogue devices. So if you realize by observing the resource tree that the device is not really quite behaving properly, then this is, this is a, maybe a good place for SDN to play and to, as I mentioned, redirect transparently the flow from the device to a, some sort of inspection engines, uh, virtualized functions before the, the flow arrives to the, the data store. So the question is, if you have uh, multiple um, protocols in the access, Bluetooth, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, how do you actually uh, control those devices or access those devices? From the perspective of IoT DM, we expect IP and we expect um, uh, some wire protocol over this. We are not uh, aware of the underlying mechanisms of the communication. So in this case, uh, JSON runs over HTTP, which runs over the whole stack. Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, all of this are below. They are a big problem in, in the field of IoT. But for us, in, 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 the, in the regard of data exchange, we're, we're a layer above, if you will. Right? So we are unaware that the device is connected Bluetooth, or if it's a simple $1 device or a, a huge uh, locomotive train, it, for us, it's just an IP stream coming at us. It, it could be this way, or it could be that uh, the device is connected Wi-Fi to a gateway to a Wi-Fi access point, and then you run IP over this from the device to the IoT DM. But you could also have an intelligent gateway that deals with the connectivity. Uh, you could have a, a, a gateway in a car that connects to a, a real real-time Ethernet environment. I mean, some some very bizarre uh, mod bus or some other. Uh, uh, pr some other uh, specific vertical specific protocols, this gateway may turn around and be the 1M2M client to us. It's also possible. We could also have, if the gateway is powerful enough, we could also have ODL running on that gateway. You're absolutely correct. Um, we, are, we are looking at uh, OIC uh, uh, at the moment, and we believe that uh, uh, 1M2M and uh, OIC should be uh, bridged together. In the real world, you will not have uh, uh, a, 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 a space that will be solely dominated by one, one set of standards. You will have in real life 
uh, vendor A and vendor B, it, they will happen to have implemented different uh, specifications. So OIC is definitely something we want to bridge into. 1M2M has uh, just proposed a work item to define a gateway function between OIC and, and uh, 1M2M. Uh, we, this is something we could certainly implement here and we are, we are waiting for this, this work to develop a little bit and maybe we'll come back to it um, and, and, and make it available in IOTDM. So we could accommodate the multi-tenancies in various ways. Uh, you could have your tenants in, um, in the same tree. So you could have one branch for one tenant, another branch for another tenant. 1M2M has provisions for that. They have access control policies that you embed into the resource tree that will tell you exactly who can access what branch. So it's, it's a... Um, but, but tenant ID inside the JSON, uh, what do you mean by that? Is oh, so the authentication piece, you, you want to make sure that you authenticate the device properly. Yeah. So, so this, I view this as um, uh, an external function to this project. This project will get a token, as, as I mentioned, you remember the call flow, so you get a token from a device, and with this token, you will, IoTDM will verify with the authentication server if the device is, I mean, what the device can do in the resource tree, basically, and what is the realm of, of that device. But IoTDM itself will not do the active authentication and verification of identity. will rely on something external. Yes, uh, 1M2M is defined in the spirit of having multiple customers in it. We could also support, actually we do support multiple trees. So we could have several instances of resource trees per customer. This is something that we, we can also do. Yes, yes, definitely. So you could have, uh, a resource tree for Coca-Cola, a resource tree for Pepsi. So you can have separate resource tree or you could have one massive resource tree with access control policies which will se segregate and segment uh, who can do what in, in the tree. Other questions? Thank you, thank you for your time, thank you.